Vivek Shreya is a musician, poet, filmmaker, writer, visual artist, and accomplished author based in Calgary, Alberta. She's a Publishing Triangle Award winner who founded the publishing imprint VS Books, and she is also one half of the music duo Too Attached. Her latest book is a critically acclaimed, instructive memoir entitled I'm Afraid of Men, which was published by Penguin Random House in 2018. Vivek and I recently connected for a conversation about growing up in Alberta, living in Toronto, and beginning to transition in her early 30s, the significance of Lilith Fair and female artists speaking out against misogyny, how she perceives gender constructs at this point in history, her plans to write a comic book with illustrator Ness Lee, a two-attached remix featuring Peaches, and much more. With the support of listeners like you who subscribe to this podcast and spread the word about it and make flexible monthly pledges at patreon.com slash creative control, plus in-kind support from CFRU 93.3 FM, Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton, this is the 452nd episode of Creative Control featuring the gifted and multi-talented Vivek Shreya with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hi, Vivek. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. It's uh, very nice to have you on my show. I I normally will ask someone, uh, a guest uh, that I'm speaking to remotely, where in the world they are. So I will will do that for you as well. Where in the world are you today? I am in Calgary, Alberta. Calgary, Alberta. Now, for some reason, (laughs) in my mind, I associate you with Toronto primarily. Are, Are you, were you, did you spend time in Toronto? Mm hmm. So I was born and raised in Edmonton, and then I moved to Toronto, um, in the early 2000s and I lived in Toronto for 15 years and then I just moved to Calgary I guess a year ago now so yeah now why why did you move to Calgary mostly because I was offered a job at the university and my academic friends were like you don't say no to that job (laughs) (laughs) and you know as an artist trying to think about long term how to sustain an arts career in Canada academia is certainly one way to do that yeah so which one is the side hustle, so to speak? Uh, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm in the same position uh, as you in some ways. A lot of us are, you know. You, of course. You have yeah. your dream. You have your uh, creative expression. Uh, and uh, these days in particular, depending on what it is, but these days in particular, it doesn't pay as many of the bills as you'd like it to. Well, that that's exactly it. So, you know, in Toronto, I was working at George Brown College for 15 years, a nine to five, and teaching has just given me a lot more flexibility. So, I mean, I... I would say the teaching is a side hustle, but that's not meant <laughs> to say that I don't care about my students or I don't care about teaching. But yeah, I mean, where I can prioritize art in my life, I, I really like to try. Yeah. And, and in your case, your art is multifaceted. We're, we're ostensibly uh, having a discussion today about your latest book, I'm Afraid of Men, which uh, let me just say right away, very powerful powerful book uh, and uh, thank you for oh, writing this you. book yeah and then but beyond that i know you as a musician as well uh, your band too attached has played in guelph a, a couple of times that i'm aware yeah of. yeah yeah so music and your all i'm saying is your cultural expression is that writing and music is there anything else yeah i've made a bunch of films i try to do and i've, I've also done some visual art as well so i i just really love like art as you know as wide as as it can be yeah. Now, is, is, does art provide you with uh, some f- sort of therapeutic release? Do you do it? I've been wrestling with this, too. My show is called Creative Control, and I, it was mm-hmm. named as such. I don't know. I named it after a song I liked. But as it has developed, I realized that, I mean, beyond the control aspect, I am very interested in creative impulses. And probably because selfishly, I, I want to get to where I'm coming from with it as well. Um, you know, why mm-hmm. why I feel compelled to try 
my best to make something. Do you have a sense of why you feel compelled to make things? Well, first of all, I've, I, I should just say that I am a big fan of your podcast and a big fan of you. So oh, um, you. I really appreciate um, you know the conversations that you have around creativity. And I'd love to pose the question back to you after if you're interested. But um, for me, I think it's a couple of things. So certainly, I think art has been a way for me to work through past trauma. Um, I think art has been a way for me to work through an idea um, mm. or an injustice. Um, I mean, I can give more specific examples, but yeah, I think that there's definitely a range of reasons why I turn to to art. But mostly, I think that there's something really exciting about having something that's abstract, essentially a thought or an idea or a challenge or a, a pain and trying to move that into something more concrete and physical that you then use as a means to connect with another human. Mm. Um, to me, there's nothing more satisfying than that, that um, cycle. So, yeah. so in a reductive sort of assessment of what you just said, I, I, would, I would say that on some level, maybe a bit like me, you're using your creative impulses and your interest in creating art to kind of process the dynamic of life, of everyday life, the up and down, the 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 sadness, the the happiness, it kind of all the joy. It kind of, I think, uh, you know, it, it, every day we wake up and that's all there. That's all there mm-hmm. in the ether. Mm-hmm. It's there in front of our face. It's there as we greet the day. But when you make something, I feel like what I've discovered in speaking to people, and often people say, "I don't know why I did that thing. I don't know why." I, <laughs> I don't know why I wrote that lyric, but as we did, as we have a discussion, you realize, oh, it's an extension of some experience they've had. <laughs> well, uh, I will say that I'm not that artist. I'm, I'm pretty decisive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, you know I where things are coming sentiment. from. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I appreciate that sentiment for sure. Yeah. Well, this brings us, I think, to to this book, um, and I guess very simply, uh, let's begin with why. Uh, you chose to write this book and, and, and the methodology you employed to discuss uh, the issues within it. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the inspiration behind I'm Afraid of Men? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, to take you on a bit of a journey, as as you said, um, I'm also a musician. And so music was sort of uh, my first medium. And that's the reason why I moved to Toronto. And um, I found it very difficult in the first seven, eight years of my career to create any momentum with music. And it was in that frustration that I ended up moving to writing books. And again, I, I, it wasn't a very deliberate move. I, I just needed to be creative and um, I needed to be creative outside of music. Mm. Because when you turn a passion into a career, you can lose a lot of what brings you joy from that passion. And Mm. so I sort of felt like music and I had a bit of a breakup. And after about four or five years uh, of like making other kinds of art, I was like, I'm ready to come back to music. I really, it's still where I ache. I still want to be writing songs. And so one of the things that really inspired me though, from the few years in which I started writing books was storytelling and I wanted to apply storytelling um, to to making an album. Right. How, and so if I was going to record an album, what was the story? And so I had just come out as trans in um, 2016. And in trying to think about what I might want to write about, I found myself thinking a lot about Lilith Fair, <laughs> amongst other things. The, oh, the festival, Lilith Fair. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, and I was thinking a lot about basically a legacy of women artists that I grew up listening to in the nineties when I was identifying as male and how fortunate I was to have artists like Tori Amos and um, Cheryl Crow and salt and Peppa talking about sexuality, talking about um, violence, talking about misogyny. And I felt like I had a debt that I needed to repay to these women. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, how do I complicate, this legacy. And, you know, the truth is a lot of pop music (laughs) isn't written by trans feminine people of color. And so I started thinking about my own experiences of misogyny and how they impacted my life. And it ended up writing a song called I'm Afraid of Men, which ended up on the album I put out in 2017 Mm -hmm. called Part-Time Woman. And after writing that song, I found that there was more that I wanted to say. I mean, the thing I love about pop music is that you're sort of forced within a three to four minute time constraint, which I love. But with I'm Afraid of Men, there felt like there was so much more that I wanted to say. And so 
it grew into this idea of a broader um, writing project or essentially an essay where I would discuss my various experiences with men, um, including when I identified as male, as someone who was essentially pushed into uh, masculinity Mm -hmm. and then resisted against it when I came out as trans. So anyways, that's a very long answer for you. So feel free to edit. <laughs> as no, necessary. no, no, no. I mean, you, you did say something um, among the interesting things you said there. I noticed you said, how can I complicate this legacy? Which I think, I don't know if you're being facetious, but that's an interesting impulse. You know, this there's a legacy of, of women speaking out uh, against uh, men and, and you felt you had something to contribute there, but it's, complicated uh, what do you suppose it says about you that you wanted to get in there and, and offer this more complicated perspective well I mean first and foremost I, I like I said I for me it, the impulse was more about feeling uh, the weight of a debt that I felt like I owed to, to yeah. these women yeah so you know it wasn't as <laughs> boisterous as just wanting to complicate <laughs> a, a giant legacy but similarly I mean as you know, so much of pop music is dominated by whiteness, by straightness, by cisness. And so when I say complicated, uh, like that legacy, I wanted to sort of create the kind of music that would allow people that are marginalized to see themselves in, in a way that they didn't have to sort of imagine themselves in. So what I mean by that is that, you know, uh, for my whole life, I've listened predominantly to white musicians, and often they're singing, you know, straight love songs. And I've had no problem having to sort of imagine a, a connection to these songs, despite our differences. But at the same time, there's this kind of work that has to be done to do that. And I think when I started touring with Too Attached with my band, a couple of years ago, we had the opportunity to open for Tegan and Sarah. And there were these amazing moments with you know, queer audience members or POC audience members who came up to us and they were like, thank you for being so visible. Thank you for, you know, sampling Bollywood. Like, thank you for for all these very specific elements that reflected a kind of difference that doesn't often get seen in pop music. And so that's yeah. sort of what I mean by complicating yeah. a legacy. Yeah. Now you, you have, you, there's a distinction to be made, I suppose, as you did between a song you wrote called I'm Afraid of Men and this book. I, I happen to know that this book has been received rather well. Talk about the distinction between the reception to that song and this, <laughs> and this book. Because you say you broke up with music a little bit, and I, I just want to, you know, I tend to talk to musicians quite a bit, and we end up talking about all sorts of things, including the, the, the harder side of being of a course, musician yeah. in Canada or anywhere these days. Can you talk about the, 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 the distinction between how the book and the song were received? I mean, the funny thing about the song is it really was unnoticed uh, for the most part. And I, by unnoticed, I mean, you, you never know how people are interacting with music at home. Uh, and I, I stay away from looking at Spotify numbers because they make me feel bad about myself. But um... <laughs> this whole this whole landscape is designed to make you feel bad about yourself. Well, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I think, you know, this is just a side note, but I think in coming back to music, I I knew that I couldn't get sucked into any numeric game because that would constantly undervalue, you know, how do you how do you match like three listens (laughs) up against spending two years on an album, right? You just can't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) But um, to return to your question, you know, when people talk about an album that they've listened to, it's always like, oh, this is my favorite song or I really like this song or you know, this is the song that jumped out. And I'm Afraid of Men from Part-Time Woman, the album was never one of the songs that stood out, which actually kind of surprised me given the title because, you know, it is a bit of a an abrasive title. I, I assumed that it would be, you know, one of the, the, the songs that would stand out and yet it wasn't. And so it's it's been interesting that the book has had such a huge response and that the title in the context of the book has also had such a huge response. And mm. Um, you know, in the past, I would have seen that as maybe indication that the song was perhaps a failure <laughs> and, you know, I should have never written the song and it should have always been a book. But, you know, now that I've moved more comfortably into, you know, uh, what it means to be a multidisciplinary artist, I, I really like the evolution of an idea. And, you know, when I started, after I finished the book, the first thing I did is actually approach my brother and we did a remix of the song. And then 
um, Peaches jumped on the track, which is awesome. Yeah. And so now there's like this whole other incarnation of the song that we've been performing live. And I find live when we play that song and we talk about misogyny on stage, that also has a very different response than the original <laughs> song as well. So yeah. I think that there's different ways, like, you know, I'm always thinking about what is the magic that makes something that makes art connect as opposed to <laughs> the magic or that, uh, that, or the absence of connection, because I know the absence very well and I have never, ever really figured that out. But I think that's one of the reasons why I keep creating is trying to get closer to understanding that magic. Well, it's a confusing time for consumption. I feel like totally, totally. I think I, on some level, I think we are reading more, uh, whether it's, because we have our phones and our computers, we are obviously typing texts and reading texts. But I also think, based on my social media feeds, which are often, and that just could be algorithms, but it's also, it's often people sharing articles. It's often people saying, did you read this? Like, read this article about whatever's happening in the news. I have a friend who's a gigantic music fan, and he's told me now in his car, he mostly listens to podcasts. He doesn't even listen to records as mm -hmm. much as music as much as he used to. So... I, I don't mean to go on a, a sidetrack us with a, a discussion about music and its place because I uh, and, and no. how it's valued. But just given your dynamic, I, I do think that's fascinating that you have received uh, accolades for this book. While, as you say, you're, the, the song itself wasn't really uh, received uh, as much, if not as well, if not as much. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing, and this is a very unsexy answer as well, is, you know, capitalism is also at play here, right? Like yes. the truth is I'm a very much an independent musician still. I don't have a label, you know, there's, there's not, uh, there's no institution that is pushing um, my music, you know? So, mm -hmm. but you know, I'm afraid to mend the book is being pushed by Penguin, which is a big institution and ostensibly one of the biggest uh, publishers in Canada. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in terms of reach um, there's definitely that, push that's happening that allows the book to reach um people that doesn't necessarily mean that people will connect to it with the, the with that push but i'm just saying that you know that has to be part of the equation around music as well is just thinking about how many of us don't have access to that kind of institutional push yeah i mean on some level it's never been easier to make music but actually absolutely having it resonate is somehow more difficult some it's <laughs> anyway it's <clears throat> again it's a sidetrack it's a tangent and i no no again, it's something I, I think about a lot and so. i think relevant to your arc uh, i i think as totally well. yeah. totally but i do i do want to talk about this book because sure there's lots of stuff to talk about obviously i let's begin with the structure of the book um which uh, for for those who haven't read it yet and i hope i hope they will uh, after this discussion, um, you divided the book ostensibly into uh, sections marked uh, you and me. And mm -hmm. my reading of the you is uh, it's a catch all for many, many men you've encountered. Is that accurate? Yes, yes. absolutely. Is the me actually <laughs> you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. OK. Yes. So the me is kind of a response to the you. Talk about yes. this structure. Why, why did you structure the book this way? Well, the book originally was written all in first person, uh, very similar to just the me section, essentially. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, I knew that I wanted to talk. I, I knew that the first half of the book was going to be me recounting var various experiences with men. I knew that the various experiences with men that I wanted to include, I wanted them to be quote unquote diverse, um, because I think so much of the conversation around me too and masculinity has been a, about a particular kind of man coming from a particular kind of woman. And yeah. so for me, it was really important to implicate, you know, men of color and queer men and trans men, like to think about how masculinity were, and, and me, which is where the me section comes in, because I think it's important for, for, for if we're going to talk about masculinity, I don't think anyone gets a pass in that conversation. And so that was really important to me. But I think one of the things that, we have noticed, you know, especially since Black Lives Matter and, you know, Eric Garner and, and, and various awful moments of police brutality in recent years that have been very visible is that there's a sort of heightened kind of attention for um, or interest in watching or reading or consuming um, the pain of marginalized bodies. There's even like this phrase trauma porn. Mm -hmm. And so I was really cautious about after I read the first draft, I was like, 
have I just created something that a reader can just, you know, engage in, put it, put it down, get on the phone, text with their friends, you know, make a chicken breast, move on, you know, and like, I worried about this sort of lack of accountability that a reader would potentially have, and yet would get to like, take so much from these stories. And so I was thinking, how do I make the reader sit with sit with me and sit with what I'm, I'm sharing more uh, in, in a more engaged way. And so I thought if I change all of these anecdotes that I've written about experiences with men to you, to second person where I'm addressing the reader directly, yeah. I, my hope was that it forced the reader to engage uh, more directly. And even if you as a reader know that I'm clearly not talking about you, it forced the language will sort of force you to think about other experiences where you might have been in such similar situations or as a bystander or, you know, um, just thinking about your own implication in these stories, even if it's not you directly. And so that was sort of the thinking. And then it was my editor who was like, you know, you move here from second person to first, uh, first person. Why don't we actually just create a divide in terms of like physical chapters to help the reader move through these um, sections. So yeah. that's where the, the you came about and the me came about because the me section is largely about me, you know, calling myself out, so to speak, and then moving into my sort of general points around uh, how to move forward with thinking about masculinity. I appreciate what you're saying there about how in in addressing the reader as you, you're not necessarily suggesting that the, the people you're describing, uh, particularly those who engaged or have engaged or continue to engage in any kind of discriminatory or, or heinous behavior, it, it doesn't necessarily, it's not meant to make the reader necessarily feel bad but no at the, but at the same time i would say uh what this uh the use of this pronoun and, and as a reader you you do you are kind of forced to recognize yourself in some of this behavior and whether like you say like whether you meant to or not you might have been complicit in this same kind of behavior and it makes you what it did for me was kind of create this stock taking of like did i have i done that did i do this? Have I been this way? Was that, are you saying, I, I just want to clarify, was that sort of your intention? Like to kind of get the reader to see themselves in these uh, scenarios, I guess? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I was never interested, despite, you know, the sort of misreadings of the title, I was never really interested in attacking men or attacking the reader per se. I but should, ha- we, we should say, I, I, like the, 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 the book's title is I'm Afraid of Men. But as my wife pointed out, and by the way, she was just today complimenting the um, the design of your book. Oh, that's so lovely. Yes, yeah, just everything about it. She She's in the book industry, and she's like, it's, oh. it's incredible. Like the design, the color scheme, and then the back of the book is where I was coming from just now. The, the mm-hmm. title is I'm Afraid of Men, but the back of the book says Men Are Afraid of Meat. And and I, I do think that's really, it's almost to me a subtitle. It doesn't come across that way in the way the book is framed, but that's part of it, isn't it? It definitely is. So, you know, I I think that for me, in writing the book, as I got towards the end, I wanted, I wanted to make it clear that my fear of men isn't just this thing that I woke up with one morning, you know, like, I'm, I'm afraid of tomatoes, or I'm afraid of like, insects, <laughs> like, you know, that it's not this like, arbitrary fear. And I mean, uh, respectfully, I think a lot of people's fears are actually rooted in something deeper. So I'm not <laughs> dismissing any other fears that people might have of tomatoes or insects. But this is all to say that um, there's something that we felt very like vulnerable about the title and almost sort of abstract. And so it felt important towards the end to talk, to make, to complete the circle and to articulate that my fear of men has often stemmed from their fear of me and the fact that when men have encountered me as quote unquote different, instead of sort of sitting with that discomfort or trying to understand why they feel uncomfortable with my difference, they have lashed out. And so my fear of men essentially comes from their fear of me. And so my editor, again, David Ross, when, when he read the first draft, he was like, what if that sort of became the back title? And I think we were also thinking a lot about the book as a tangible object in and of itself as an art object in and of itself and how the book might take up 
space in public situations like mm. like public transport and so like what does it mean to oh, I, I mean it's been really interesting actually to to see people tweet and talk about reading this book on the TTC or on the streetcar and you know uh, you know men coming up to them and talking to them or or what it means to like hold up something that says I'm afraid of men in public in public spaces where but it would often, also but it would also say men are afraid of me that's fascinating exactly yeah. exactly exactly huh. right so I think that was a big part of thinking about the design of the book too, was how would this book operate outside of the text inside, but just as a, like an art object in moving around in the world. Well, uh, that's fascinating in itself. I mean, the, one of the things you get to by the end of the book uh, is that the conventional gender uh, distinctions are inherently flawed and create this fear uh, and create mm-hmm. this anxiety and that's that's telling in itself. I mean, this is not you're you're addressing misogyny, uh, of course, um, and you're addressing your experiences. But in the end, you are trying to speak to the fact that the way we've come to understand gender in a conventional sense is outmoded. It's outdated and it's creating these boundaries that don't need to be there. And those boundaries, like all borders, like all boundaries, create tension. Who can cross this boundary? Who can't? Uh, how they're how they're negotiating uh, these these sort of physical borders that that separate us. You know what I mean? And I, I found that compelling in itself. I mean, you just gave me chills. Like that's that would that's the best summary <laughs> possible. So thank you. <laughs> well, I, I, and the other thing I, I took away from it, and at one point you you I don't think you allude to this too often, but you allude to the fact that you've gone through therapy. And I've gone through therapy uh, in the last year, and it's striking to me how uh, in my case, and I believe in yours, the, the therapist will want to get to the formative part of your life where whatever you're dealing with may have stemmed from. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I find that because you, the, 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 the you chapter that, or the you section, I should say, spends so much time uh, negotiating uh, your youth, uh, mm-hmm. you know, your upbringing, mm-hmm. the relationships you had coming up and, and your recollection of those moments and how they've, made you into who you are today how difficult was that to go through that exercise in therapy or writing well the book? i feel like they might be connected did the therapy <laughs> spark this in some way that was my reading i will say like there's so much trauma in the you section and um you know you also say i i know that uh, others have maybe experienced uh, other kinds of violence, worse violence than the ones mm-hmm. I'm documenting here, and, and that's noble of you. But at the same time, when I think about uh, bullying and, and being bullied uh, because of whatever reason, you know, I'm I, I'm an Indian guy. Right. I, I've never really felt, uh, I don't know, I, I, I didn't, exp- I, I guess... I just didn't linger on racism at that point. I tried to own it, you know, by of course, being a yeah. bit of a self-hating Indian on some level, making the <laughs> jokes before they could, Yep, that kind of stuff. And you yep. you talk about that a little bit too. Anyway, I just wonder, like, that's a key thing that people don't really do. Uh, and therapy still has a kind of connotation that some people aren't willing to, you know, get into. Like, I don't need therapy, you know what I mean? And and, mm-hmm. and sort of identify why they are the way they are, why they think the way they think, why they're afraid of what they're afraid of. And I, I'm just opening this up as a conversation about maybe the merits of therapy. And if, if you don't see the connection between those sessions you had and, and this writing, please feel free to say so. But I, I read that a little bit. I, I identified with that. Like, oh, yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, thanks for that. I mean, I have a lot to say about therapy and mental health as someone who has, um, you know, struggled with depression and thinking about suicide for most of my life. And um, I was definitely somebody who was very averse to therapy. I was like, I don't need that. I have my own skills. And somehow going to therapist felt like a bit of a failure, like I'd failed my own ability to deal with my quote unquote issues. And yeah, I think it was um, turning 30 where I was like, well, I'm still str- struggling with some of these, um, you know, issues and some of my past experiences. And I would love to just get more tools in my toolkit, so to speak, in terms of like navigating these things when they emerge. And honestly, going to a therapist like changed my life. And I, I, I'm 
I talk about it. I try to be very public about talking about it because for the reasons that you described, I think there is still much, still so much stigma yeah. around therapy. And I mean, some, some of the issues around therapy is also access um, and affordability, which is a whole other conversation oh, but yeah. in terms Absolutely. of yeah. like, you know, the value of a therapist, like, you know, culturally, I think most people have or understand a value to some sort of physical activity. So even if you're not a gym bunny, you understand that like moving around is like useful f- for your body. And I really felt like, like therapy was gym for your brain. And we don't really talk about that, like the importance of needing for your mind and your emotions to be exercised mm-hmm. in a particular way. And, um, you know, certainly I think that working with a therapist, some of my past obviously came out especially this one particular incident which I hadn't thought too much about about being spit on um while I was waiting at a bus stop in in junior high and being spit um, on being spit on by a brown boy right exactly yeah I'm this person in this particular anecdote wasn't brown I don't think Um, oh I'm sorry another anecdote yeah so so just uh, just to be clear I I (laughs) in in the you section there's, uh, as I suggested, the you uh, encompasses multitudes, and I, I think in my mind, I, I I vividly pictured this scene um, of, and in my mind, it was a brown boy spitting on you mm-hmm. while his girlfriend giggled, um, mm-hmm. and and how that impacted you, and you're wearing your your mother's Jordache jean jacket yeah. in the in the scene, and exactly, you can't wear it again because you get home and you discover that you it has the stains of bullying and um, prejudice and, and whatnot. So exactly. Yeah. So that, that scene was something, or I mean, that moment was something I definitely recalled in therapy. And like I said, in the book, like I found myself thinking less about the boy that spat on me and more about the, the girl that was laughing and like thinking about how there was also probably other kids around and potentially even other adults. And so much what I started working through in therapy was thinking about the complicity of adults and, and the complicity of the bystander and how, often a lot of the things that had happened to me, there were other people around. And um, anyways, this is a bit of a side note here, but in terms of its connection to, to the book, I think mostly therapy gave me um, room to go back and to think about some of these incidents that I guess had just been sitting there yeah. dormant. And, you know, the book, um, you know, was an opportunity to, to sort of flesh those things out a little bit more. The one thing I will say, um, if I may, before we jump from here, um, if we jump from here, <laughs> sure. is just, um, I think one of the things I've gotten asked a lot about this project is, has it felt therapeutic to write? And I, you know, did it feel cathartic to write? And certainly other projects I've made have felt like cathartic or therapeutic. And I think, you know, certainly when you're marginalized, there is an, uh, there is an assumption that if you're sharing a story of um, oppression or art that d- of all, in, you know discusses oppression, that it's somehow um, freeing. But uh, the thing that I've tried to make clear with this book is that you know, as a trans person, my fear of men doesn't go away just because I write a book called I'm Afraid of Men, (laughs) you know, like I still have a day to day life. And so in a lot of ways, the book didn't actually feel therapeutic, It actually felt really hard to go in to some of these old stories, I had repeated dreams of being beaten up by men throughout writing this book. So, you know, I, the reason why I br- it almost had the opposite effect. It sounds like. yeah. The reason why I bring this up is just because of the connection that's made to therapy and I, that you were talking about. And I just sort of wanted to to speak to the ways that like sometimes art is not about um, doesn't necessarily create healing. You know, sometimes it can, well, <laughs> yeah, like you said, it can almost do the opposite. Yeah, and I, I think the one thing that people mistake about therapy is that they, they dwell on the therapeutic aspect of the term, but. Therapy is highly triggering. Um, exactly. The whole exactly. the whole exercise is actually just like, oh shit, I didn't remember that. Um, I don't remember. I didn't remember that being that impactful until we just started talking about it. And um, I, I think, hopefully, ultimately, it, dealing with an issue is supposed to resolve it on some level. But it might take, you know, if you are sitting on something for 20 years, who knows? It might take you 20 years to feel better about it. You know what I mean? They often, people, it, people say that. It, it, it's true. But when, when it's, when you're talking about the violence of, let's say racism or misogyny, we still live in a like misogynist and racist world. Yes. Right. So like, yeah. no matter how much art I make about 
the pain of those experiences, the, the reality is my day-to-day experiences continue, right? So, I mean, I've, I've tried to create a world that feels as safe for me as possible, but like, um, and that's sort of the point that I'm trying to make is that like my fear of men endures, right? Beyond the book and be, I can certainly come to terms with those past experiences, but in a way it's hard to fully move past them because I have to encounter day-to-day experiences of that same fear that sometimes triggers that old stuff, you know? Well, I mean, one of the most striking sentences in your book for me was, I'm also afraid of women. Uh, Right. Which we got into a little bit in terms of, uh, you know, uh, common understandings and misunderstandings and misperceptions of gender dynamics. But that's that's really telling. Like this this anecdote that you're describing um, in terms of, you know, being spit on and hearing this woman giggling um Mm -hmm. at this i mean that can't be discounted i mean there's complicit this actually brings me to you know we've talked a lot about you we've talked about people asking you about you know whether this is therapeutic as i'm reading the book and as i as the pronouns interchange i i I found myself thinking who is this book for um (laughs) on some level like it feels to me like it could be for people who uh, and, I, and you know, you can't control this. I know this. But in your intention, this is an eye-opening book um, for everyone, I would think. Anyone who reads it, whether you are a bully, whether you've been bullied, whether you're transgendered, whether you are uh, heterosexual, wh- 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 however you identify, I feel like there's something to be taken from this. Is Was that potentially your intention? Like, this is a book? Not I know. You know what I mean. I know every book is for everyone, but <laughs> did you have an idea, like, if this book is instructive, if you're talking about therapy, if you're talking about ways we can alter our thinking, which you do by the end of the book in a glorious way, I feel, uh, in terms of oh, tackling what, what, what gender might mean in this day and age and our understanding of it, did you have an audience in mind, per se? I mean, I, this is such a good question, and I, I definitely had conversations with my editor around the likelihood that this book would be read largely by women, um, mostly because women tend to be the largest uh, book buying demographic, uh, but also because of the title. Um, we sort of like assumed that women would feel sort of comforted or seen by a title that spoke to to fear of men. Um, that said, I, I like a good challenge. <laughs> and I was like, I, I did really want to write something that, like I said, not only spoke to the ways that we're all implicated, but similarly, if you're going to speak to the, if you're going to create a project that tries to speak to the ways that we're all implicated in this conversation of masculinity, then similarly, I felt a kind of responsibility to to write a book that would also feel accessible enough for everyone to read. Yeah. So the book is written from, uh, you know, a, a, I try to avoid like, you know, academic jargon um, or like really dense language. I mean, I have respect for that particular kind of language. Um, I don't do it very, very well anyways, but. Um, but there's I a, think, there's a thesis, right? I mean, there's an underlying argument. Oh, there's argument. definitely, yeah. there's definitely, I mean, that's the thing. There's definitely uh, an argument. There's several arguments. Yes. But, um, at the, but I, I did want it to feel, and part of it's also thinking about the ways that language can alienate a reader, right? Like, mm. you know, one of the sections that my editor and I, editor and I talked a lot about was the section where I just have a paragraph where I use the word misogyny over and over again. Um, And I I basically recall all of these incidents from the first chapter. And I speak about how each one of these experiences were rooted in misogyny. And I really grappled with that because the truth is, if you say the word misogyny, suddenly people just check out. You can literally see people (laughs) leave their bodies and float somewhere else. You know, it's kind of like using the word patriarchy or, um, you know. When you say people check out, do you primarily mean men? I think men, but I think that... um, (sighs) I I only ask this because you do make a point uh, at various points in this book where like i said earlier like there are we we like to think we're good men you say this the good the good man is a fiction and that's Mm -hmm. that's really a telling 
sentence. We try to convince ourselves, and then, and I don't, just so people understand, this book does not make you feel bad about yourself. Uh, <laughs> I just want to be clear. It's not an accusatory book. It is a reflective book, and it is a book that provokes thoughts and, and I hope provokes a kind of self-awareness on some level of like, how have I behaved and on some level, and have I been complicit, as most of us have been in the Totally. You know, whatever the violence against the, the proliferation of violence against uh, women in particular. So I feel like this book res- could res- it does resonate on many levels. But this good man is a fiction uh, line. This notion that men's behavior has been forgiven as being typical, and you say typical is dangerously interchangeable with acceptable, and that's what's occurred. That's what's happened over time. Mm-hmm. So when you talk about misogyny, uh, and you say people are put off by it. I feel like they don't want to deal with the issue at hand, uh, what that word stands in for, which is a larger societal issue. Part of, yes, I do think that that's the case, but I also think that like words that, I don't know, we, we, there are, I'm a real big believer in the, 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 the importance of specificity around language. You know, um, for me, it's really important to name misogyny. It's important to name patriarchy. It's important to name white supremacy. But also as a writer, I understand that if I use those kinds of words, that it's going to have a particular reaction. Yeah, yeah. And um, so for me, I think that the way to answer the question that like we were just talking about is like, I felt like the best way to, before starting the book with those words, I sort of, it was more about how do I show the experience of misogyny in the body as opposed to just using that language. And so at the end I use that language because I do think it's important to name things, but um, you know, and again, this was an approach that I hoped would make the book feel as readable and as accessible as possible. And I mean, the thing I will say that has surprised me profoundly about the book is, I mean, responses like yours. I mean, the truth is I feel like I have received almost as many messages from men Um, And not hate messages like, you know, this book moved me or challenged me or inspired me or actually reflected my similar experiences to me from men as I have from women. Mm -hmm. So for me, that that's that's really exciting. I mean, I don't want to get too hopeful (laughs) (laughs) about the world, but um, certainly I I didn't expect that. I really thought that there would be a, a lot more of a negative reaction from men across the board from from this book. So. You know, you talked about how people have asked you about the whether or not the book has been therapeutic and how it impacted mm-hmm. how it's impacted you, how writing it has impacted you. You've just described how the reception for the book has been more heartening than you expected. Um, mm-hmm. Is there anything else about the book that has I don't know changed your mind, altered you in in some way where you feel like? Uh, positively or negatively like uh, i'm just curious about you i'm checking in i'm checking in with you right now (laughs) you've finished this book it's being received well uh by and large i'm sure you've probably encountered um some measure of uh uh, criticism for it as well who knows i i I yep (laughs) try not to i try not to read that stuff which is maybe good or bad i don't know how are you feeling generally like the book's been out it's circulating it's a true uh, and genuine expression of yourself and and your thoughts uh, on on gender and 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 all sorts of things. How are you feeling? I, for the most part, do feel quite heartened. Um, I think that I think that for me, one of the biggest takeaways from the the book is maybe less connected. Well, I mean, you can't disconnect from the content, but I think <laughs> um, you know one of the things that I've heard a lot in every art industry is the ways that if you are a person of color and you're queer or any of these other identities that your work is niche and that's how your, your work is taken up. That's how like literally you go to a bookstore, like previous books of mine are, you know, are shelved in the, in the LGTB section gender or, studies or whatever. gender yeah. studies yeah. or race and relations. And so like, this is how your work and the same thing with music. Like one of the reasons why, you know, I deliberately stayed away from any Indian references in the first half of my career as a musician is because I like dreaded the label of world music, you know, like of I course. just, you yeah. know, did not want to be seen that way. And I think for me, what has felt really exciting has been the sort of proof of this book um, that the, that this book has given me in that you can actually 
you know, it, if if an institution is willing to get behind a project, um, and give an opportunity to a voice, you can actually have a project by a trans feminine person of color be deemed quote unquote universal and right. accessible right. and not niche, right? Like in a lot of ways, what deems work niche is less our identities and more um, the institution's inability to get behind these projects. Right. So for me, like seeing I'm afraid of men on like the bestseller list for weeks and weeks, I was like, and next to, you know, Jordan Peterson or any other like <laughs> white male authors, I was like, for me, this felt like a really significant moment in my career personally as a moment of kind of redemption to be like, see, I, t- I told you I wasn't just sitting here writing like, because the thing is niche is a very loaded word, yes. right? Like niche, what, what niche is saying, right? Is that nobody really cares about your work unless they're the same as you. Yeah. And, and, and we know that as, you know, as Brown people, we know that that's a lie for the reasons I talked about earlier, right? That like we have been able to appreciate you know, white art for most of our lives. Mm -hmm. So we, we understand that you don't actually have to be the same kind of person to like or engage or connect or, or feel seen by some art. So anyways, not to go on too much of a rant here, but for me, I think that that has felt like the most important uh, or the most um, fulfilling part of the way that this book has been taking up is just sort of like, yeah, to use this word redemption again, <laughs> to be like, I told you, I wasn't well, just sitting here. <laughs> I, I will say, to, uh, institutional support or not, I mean, you've already spoken to this. I think your the aesthetic considerations you made to make the book as accessible as possible, to to make it, uh, you know, as you, you sort of suggested, you, you didn't want to create this academic, um, dry book. You've made a very personal book and it is it, it, it i you use the word universal and i feel it has i feel it has that quality and i do think that's a testament to you and your writing style it's it's a it's a towering achievement and it's a for those Thank who don't you. know it's a short it's a rather short book um and but i've read it a few times and i i i take something different away from it each time so for whatever that's worth to you i just hope uh, other people also uh, take this into consideration it's a wonderful book you know, it really, really means a lot coming from you, especially, like I said, I've just been a huge like oh, admirer, and I, I dreamt of being on your radar one day, so I'm, <laughs> I'm happy that it finally happened. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, uh, Vivek. So I, as I, you know, as we wind down here, what's next for you? We've Look, I don't know how you're going to top this book. I, I think that's <laughs> the subtext of what I was saying. No, I'm just kidding. Uh-huh. I, I know you're a very creative I wondered, person. <laughs> I wondered if that's what you were asking. I mean, yeah. I mean, with any project, I feel a certain kind of pressure. And, you know, like with every, with any success I've had, because I've had so much, the, like I've had so, so many years of the lack of success, any like success I've had, I've always been like, oh no, like, is this it? Like, have I peaked? And I've certainly had <laughs> those thoughts. Well, right? I was, but, I was totally kidding. I really just wondered what you, you know, this book is, uh, we're still, uh, it's still resonating with people. Obviously, we're still talking about it, but in some senses, it's done. It's behind you. What's coming up next for you? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I mean, formally, what's happening next is uh, a comic book that comes out in April with an artist, with an illustrator by the name of Ness Lee, who's um, Toronto-based and incredible, incredible artist. Her work's kind of like all over the city. And um, I started... Uh, I mean, it's funny, it's in a way, it's kind of like a nice transition out of I'm Afraid of Men, um, or from I'm Afraid of Men. Two years ago, I started receiving very visual hate mail from a particular stranger. And they used all kinds of like Indian dialect, they referred to my mom a couple times. Oh, my God. And I mean, unlike usual trolls that I I have on, on Twitter, and I, I just sort of block right away, there was something about this conjuring of family and of my culture that made these letters quite haunting and um simultaneously for the past three years i've been engaging in a lot of graphic books because um one of my friends is an illustrator and i've just been curious about the medium it hasn't of of a lot of like literary mediums it's one that hasn't really um appealed to me um immediately and as i started getting more into comics the thing that has uh, awakened me to the medium is just how strange um, they can be, you know, with I'm Afraid of Men, you know, it's a very, in, in some ways, there, there's a traditional element to it. It's an essay where we know what, you know, as you said, there's a thesis to it, you know, like, mm-hmm. but with comic books, you can kind of just go off the rails. And so I had this wacky idea, um, which is now going to be a comic book, which will be out in the spring called Death Threat. 
And basically it's a very, it's a hyper meta uh, exploration of these letters that I received and, you know, the impact that um, it had on me, but trying to like navigate this through like quote unquote dark humor. And again, using art as a way to, um, you know, reclaim my power in, in what is, you know, ostensibly a, a, uh, a difficult experience. I, I must say, I really appreciate your ability and your the tenacity you have in taking the hate that's projected towards you and turning it into something that might be. I don't want to say the. I, I didn't want to use the word useful, but this notion of taking some hatred and and turning it into something positive somehow. Mm -hmm. um, that's quite an. Uh, that's a remarkable instinctual impulse that I don't think a lot, some of us just don't have it. You know, we just accept the hate for what it is and, and try to <laughs> make the best of it somehow. But you seem to be, no, I'm going to use this. I'm going to use this for something. That, that's, okay. that's pretty remarkable. Thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, part of it also with death threat is especially thinking about the ways that for most of like for a lot of people's jobs were expected to be on the internet. And yet um, there's no protective measure. So we're all very accessible and very visible, but there's nothing really in place to prevent people from not sending you hate messages. So I, for me with this particular project with death threat, I really wanted to like sort of think more about the responsibilities of being online. And yet the, the sort of underbelly of that for a lot of us, um, like what, what the implications of being in, online are for us in our day to day. I know it's impossible maybe to be objective about this because you're living in it and the and the amount of hate mail you get sounds substantial, but there's this whole sort of notion that being loved is one thing, but if you're loved and hated, it might mean you're doing something right. Does that give you <laughs> does that give you any peace or, or peace of mind? Like, oh well at least it's resonating somehow. Um yeah, I mean certainly as, you know, artists that have come before me said like I mean Many artists have talked about how they, you know, they'd rather someone, you know, love or hate them as opposed to being indifferent. Right, so, I mean, I right. certainly feel the same way, like, you know, with like art that has been titled, like, I'm afraid of men or even this page is white. Like, I want to make art that is engaging and that is thought provoking. So, yeah, certainly um, I, I appreciate the, the polarization, but simultaneously, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, it was a bit of an odd question, I suppose. Like, no one is like, oh, yeah, I love being trolled by psychopaths. I, I, I know that's not the case, but... You know, truthfully, what I will say is, you know, the hate from psychopaths, to use your language, you know, it's its own kind of experience, and it doesn't, like, weigh me down too much. And I think because I'm so fortunate to be loved by people who really care about me and see me, I think for me, some of the harder... Um, Harder stuff is just the the critiques that come from your own communities. Like, mm -hmm. I think that, again, and I don't know if you experience this as a brown person, but I certainly, you know, within queer communities, trans communities, and brown communities, I feel a kind of um, accountability to these communities. And when I get criticisms from within these communities, it often feels like I've, I've failed my communities. Yeah. And I find those kinds of um, criticisms um, or, or, or negative reactions a lot more, um, detrimental. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I understand that they go a bit deeper just because your culture and your family are intertwined there as well. I understand. Exactly. That. Look, I, I know you have to go, so I, I, I don't mean to be abrupt here, but, um, no, not at all. There's a couple of things I just wanted to take care of. Uh, one, can you tell us, where people can learn. I know we just said that the internet is terrible. Can you tell us where <laughs> where you'd like people to learn more about you uh, using the internet, perhaps? Sure. And then also, I, also, just so I can get this out of the way, sure. if you don't mind picking a song, perhaps, from Too Attached or something that we can go out on. I just wanted to get it all out so I'm not babbling and delay, okay. yeah, delaying no, this any no. further. But uh, those I'm, two things. I'm good. Yeah, okay. yeah, so I, I mean, to be clear, I don't hate the internet. I think there's lots of great <laughs> things about the internet. I mean, we found each other on the internet. That's sort true. Of maybe. Um, That's true. So uh, I, I'm i very active on social media. So at Vivek Shreya, V-I-V-E-K-S-H-R-A-Y-A. -E and then I'm, I take a lot of pride in my website, VivekShreya.com. I treat it kind of as an archive of like a body of work by a trans feminine artist in Canada. So there's like lots of like free videos, free music, um, articles. Uh, basically, yeah, it's, 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 it's an archive. So please, please go check it out. And okay. um, in terms of a song recommendation, why not the 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 I'm Afraid of Men remix with Peaches. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that sounds good. So, and how do you know Peaches? 
Uh, <laughs> I do not. <laughs> okay. Internet. Was it the oh, internet? Oh, the internet. It yes. was through the internet. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, this is uh, I'm Afraid of Men by Two Attached featuring uh, Peaches. Uh, Vivek, thank you so much for being on this program and for pouring your heart out in this book and, and, and in this conversation. It means a lot to me, and I wish you the best of luck going forward. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Your thumb Up your own bum I say it loud with the bass drum Can't remain numb Uh uh Your words Absurd Malarkey Fuck the patriarchy Fuck the patriarchy My house in my house Don't even turn the lights on Cause I shine so bright But when I open the door My glow starts to fade Cause I'm a I'm a my neck hurts from checking my shoulder My feet hurt from walking faster Are you hitting on me? Are you hitting on me? Or are you gonna hit me? That'll crap, zap, step back. You need the intersectional men's feminist app. special thanks to Vivek Shreya for being on this, the 452nd episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One Podcast Network and is available on all iOS and Android platforms and, and on many, many other things as well, including Spotify, YouTube, and Audio Boom. If you can't find an episode that you're looking for on any of those platforms, or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my semi-regularly scheduled newsletter, please visit vishkana.com. You can like Creative Control on Facebook, follow the show on Twitter at Vish Creative, or follow me at Vish Khanna. Also listen to a radio show version of Creative Control on Wednesdays at noon Eastern Standard Time, around the world at CFRU.ca, or on an actual radio at 93.3 FM if you're in or near Guelph. Also visit Patreon.com 
slash creative control to make a flexible monthly pledge a donation i should say it's a it's a donation really a flexible monthly donation to keep this podcast going uh, your contributions to this end are very appreciated and uh, do in fact keep the podcast going so again patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation for the podcast okay also who, who else do i gotta thank oh yeah in kind support pizza trocadero the bookshelf planet bean coffee and granddad's donuts support the show with in kind treats for me it means the world to me and my family love those places thank you very much thank you to my dear friend jim guthrie he lets me use the instrumental version of his song the rest is yet to come every week on this show thank you very much jim and you can learn more about him at jimguthrie.org he's up to lots of stuff something just came out something big so you should go to jimguthrie.org to learn more about that and finally thank you thank you for listening to this uh, program this podcast and uh, telling your friends about it spreading the word about it it means a lot and I hope you will continue to do that and uh, yeah that's all I have to say I will talk to you very very soon goodbye for now <laughs>